Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Brew, and today we're talking about Achan, who hath stolen the bacon. Uh, after the Battle of Jericho in the Book of Joshua, we come to the Battle of Ai, which was not successful for the Israelites. Does anybody know why it was not successful for the Israelites? Oh, oh, I know, I know. Oh, let's not always see the same hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I kind of know. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What the text says is, this is chapter seven, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand go up and smite Ai. Make not all the people to labor thither, but they are but few. So they went up thither of the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men. And they chased them before, before the gate, even unto Shabarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and they shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus <laughs> upon thy face? Israel has sinned. They have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and assembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more except you destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people and uh, against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you've taken away the accursed thing from among you. And they go on and they call the tribes and cast lots and from the tribe of Judah more lots until they work their way down by family and come to this man Achan. Um, and Joshua rather kindly says, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him, and tell now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And they can answer Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus have thus have I done. I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight. And then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they're hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Joshua sent messengers, they find it, they bring it back. Now they have corroborating evidence to go with the testimony. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, and his sons and his daughters, and his oxen, his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them into the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire. After they had stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones to this day. So the Lord turned away from the first of his anger. Therefore, the place is called the Valley of Achor, trouble unto this day. And then God hands Joshua a battle plan that we won't spend much time with, at least now. But Israel gets really serious and devotes all their resources to this little thorn in their flesh. And God hands Ai over to them with some trickery. And uh, the conquest of uh, Canaan gets back on track. So there you go. This is one of the more anti-American stories in the Bible because we look at this <laughs> and we say, but that's not 
fair. Israel didn't know what this guy had done. Why is God holding the whole nation accountable? And here are, what was it, 37? I can never remember for sure. I 36. Believe. Okay. 36. 36. Let's get the number wrong. 36 men, fathers, brothers, who will never be going home to their families. And in, to the American psyche, this seems uncalled for. Well, God could have warned them. Yes, God could have. We're, there's, a, there's a couple things going on here. One, of course, is the basic doctrine of representation. Americans have a real hard time with this, despite the fact that supposedly we live in a representative republic. <laughs> uh, we, we, we elect these people that we call representatives, and they pass laws and get us involved in all kinds of things, whether it be the Federal Reserve System or World War I and II or whatever, um, without actually asking us without our vote, without our consent. And that in itself is not a problem. Now, whether or not they do it, uh, are doing a good job is something else, whether or not they're obeying God is something else. But the fact that they act for us is the way the system works, the way it's supposed to work. And no, they're not supposed to have to consult us about everything. This is the genius of Republican government. And it's Republican with a small r. Not. And that's genius as a central <laughs> defining idea, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Not as the brilliance of it, although there's yeah. something to be said for that too. Right. There, the, the roots in Presbyterian theology and ecclesiology are very deep here, mm -hmm. but also in feudalism, uh, the federalism of the Middle Ages. And, and, and we're actually practically used to this. Uh, a general on the battlefield yells charge, and suddenly whole, two whole nations are at war. A president makes a phone call on a red phone, and suddenly nukes are flying. A pastor uh, commits adultery with the church secretary, and the church is divided and even shut down. Uh, a father is irresponsible with family finances, and the family is out on the street, and relatives are having to take them home. And in each case, it may be that the people the leader represents had no knowledge, didn't know what was going on, and maybe it even would have been difficult for them to know what was going on. They're really not to blame. And yet the consequences follow. This is called life. Mm -hmm. and, and to say that it's not fair in and of itself is to simply be a hypocrite. This is the way we live. Uh, if the neighbor kid knocks a baseball through our window and the neighbor kid's six, we don't go and ask him to pay for the window. We go to his dad and say, your kid broke my window. Please do something about this. And dad doesn't say, well, when he's old enough, he'll get a job. And um, <laughs> well, he can start going around collecting cans. I'm sure within a few years, he'll have enough. Uh, no, the, there is a covenanted responsibility here. The family, within the family, the child represents the family. Family represents the child. Father represents the child. There are connections here where what one of us does affects everybody. This is true of families. It's true of churches. A church member goes online and says, I am a member of such and such a church. And I think... <laughs> um, You've just given that church a reputation. <clears throat> yeah, you have. And the elders can quickly try to get online and delete it and say, no, 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 that's a, they're not speaking for us. You're not affiliated with us. But um, <laughs> it doesn't always work because, well, but they go to your church, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> and especially when the elders don't act quickly, he says, speaking from experience. Uh, and we let things simmer too long, it can give us a, a, a black eye. Why didn't you stop this guy? You, you heard he was online. We told him to stop. He just said he would and then started again. So the, these, are, these are normal matters of life. And it's rooted in the nature of God. I don't remember exactly what the outline says, but it's kind of hard not to go there right now. <laughs> um, because this is what it means to be a person in the presence of other people, right? Yeah, this this is this is humanity. You, we can look at our common standing in Adam, as Christians, mm -hmm. our common standing in Christ. 
we can see that we each are members of families, of commonwealths, communities, city states, whatever nations. Uh, we are members of churches. And this, these are things that God has established. God ordained family, mm -hmm. God ordained commonwealth, God ordained church, local congregation, and the body of Christ collectively. Because God created man in his image. And so we look back beyond man, back into eternity and out beyond creation into the essence of God. And we find there that the Father has eternally revealed himself, represented himself in his Son. The Son is the image of the Father, uh, the image of the living God. He's his logos, is the very word of his heart. He is an accurate representation, the exhaustively accurate representation of the Father. And the Father is well pleased in him. So when we look at the Son, we see the Father. And from both, the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally and from eternity into uh, time, into history, and brings to us the word of the Father and the Son together. So we have a self-revealing God. We have a God who represents himself. Revelation and representation are different ways of looking at what is fundamentally the same thing. Uh, God is not a closed off God. God is not an isolated God. He's not a God who has no ties and is a loner and does not want to be touched or bothered or connected. He's going to sit over here and read his book, watch you know, his favorite movie. He is... Uh, God is tripersonal, and there is this eternal fellowship, but the Son being of the same essence of the Father, being together than being one God, there's accurate representation. This is God. This is ultimate reality. And so when God creates man in his image, we shouldn't be at all surprised that this idea of representation is incorporated throughout, throughout creation. We're talking about on the human level, you can talk about other levels. You can talk about um, light represent the light that streams from the sun representing the sun. You can talk about the music in the air representing the birds that it came from. And you can go on and on and on <laughs> as one sort of phenomena manifests itself, comes from, flows out of something else. This is this is just reality. This is the way the world works. So that in itself is it shouldn't be. We should be able to wrap our heads around that. Yeah. Have you ever had a like had a friend and then sort of get to know what this person's family is like and then you meet their parents and you're like, oh, you make so much more sense now. <laughs> like even though you already knew this person and you sort of knew about their family, it all fits together <laughs> and you understand more the more you meet. Yeah. And I think that's always really fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any examples come to mind, Brian? Oh, uh, weirdly disconnected from myself, yes. Um, my fiance had the same experience when she met my parents in person, <laughs> where uh, afterwards she basically went, I think she like she looked at me after we had finished whatever conversation with my parents for the, like the first day that she was in town, and she went, so many things make sense now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And she meant that in a good way. Yeah, no, she did actually. Yeah. So. <laughs> Just in case your parents are listening. Uh, you know, the funny thing for me, though, is I know both of your parents. I know your dad pretty well because we, we spent... Um, um, Most of that one year talking. Yeah, the one year in Bible class, which started previous, I think, first came the trip to Europe. Hmm. Or, in some oh, way. yeah, because that was uh, that was uh, the Bible class he sat in was my senior year. That's right. Yeah. So I got to know him as an adventurer in Europe, as someone was a, a chaperone. <laughs> well, you know, as a chaperone that year, we went to Paris, and there were pickpockets all over. Oh yeah, and, and he was very bold to help defend the, the, not only the young ladies in in our group, but the rather dense, oblivious young ladies in the other group who didn't understand <laughs> pickpockets or how you avoid them or how you don't get stolen from. Uh, you know, and then he sat a, a year in our Bible class. And uh, although our theology is at some points different, we had a great time. He was, uh, he was an asset to be sure. So, mm -hmm. and yet I know him, and yet I see some of him in you, but not a lot. I probably see more of your mom in you. That's but, true. But, uh, <laughs> you know, your, your zeal most certainly is in your dad. 
Mm-hmm. Sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we have to be a little, we have to know people and we have to look for subtleties. I don't know. Uh, I, I think if people knew my parents, they would see my mom and me first. But I look back and I can see some very stark things that I get from my dad, both good and bad. I mean, if you say conspiracy theory, that's my dad. And I <laughs> don't completely apologize for it. Um, but uh, anyway, this is, again, normal life. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we say as a, like father, like son, we assume that the one represents himself to some degree for good reasons, which are bound by covenant. Now, the problem, of course, is, and and this is what you wanted to bring up, Emily, so go ahead and shoot. What's the... Oh, yeah. So this is not only an American principle, but a principle of the book of Deuteronomy. When Moses says, you shall not put the children to death for the sins of the father and vice versa. So there's some kind of individualism there if we want to see it in the text. Uh, yeah. So how does that fit? Um, when you first brought this up with me, I had one answer. And in the um, 25 minutes that have followed, I have a different answer, which is more accurate. <laughs> I'm very curious to see if either of your answers are similar to my answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my first uh, my first thoughts have to do with uh, they, they, it's it's the right direction i just wasn't going far enough uh when when you're dealing face to face with god and god has set parameters <laughs> and god's the one calling sure. the shots that's a little different from civil government mm-hmm. uh, that's it, exactly where i was going to go if, if <laughs> we, this is talking about man dealing with man yeah and and that's and what i what I just said is true. It's just not true enough. And I'll, I'll develop that in a second. Mm-hmm. But th- there's this obvious thing of um, let's not have blood feuds. <laughs> let's not. <laughs> you know, your, your son took our pig. We must kill all your children now. Let's not do that. Let's have no Hatfield and McCoys. Because uh, where does it end? Them's fighting words. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> we don't need to have entire clans over successive generations. Uh, at each other's throats because something happened in the past and we don't even know for sure who did what to whom. The law avoids that. And it's one reason that the Bible does establish civil government so that we don't reduce down to, down to clan law and perpetual blood feuds over generations. Uh, God tells the civil government, yet yeah, execute the person who committed the capital crime. It doesn't bleed over, spill over to anyone else. Our own constitution reflects this. No punishment, no blood of attainder, or those other fancy Latin words. Uh, the Constitution throws in that says, don't punish the kids or take away their stuff, or taint their blood or taint them with treason because their father did something. Because that was something the old world did a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, your father did something to me before I came king. Now that I'm king, obviously, it's retroactively treason. And therefore, all of his lands are forfeited, which means all your lands are forfeited, which means... You pay. You need to pay all the bills that your father accrued. Oh, you have no money. You are now in a debtor's prison. And he just kept going and going. And our Constitution says, no, that's not right. And it has a good biblical basis for saying that's not right. I mean, it, it sort of brings to mind, you know, every action movie where the villain says, all right, well, you, you interfered with my plan for mm. XYZ, this drug deal, this world domination plan, you know, whatever it is, depending on yeah. the genre. It's like, I'm going to kill your kids now. It's like, it's a, it's a very inherently yeah. wicked thing when you're dealing man to man. Yeah. And it's, 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 I want to hurt you as badly as you've hurt me or more so. And the thing that will hurt you most is taking your kids. Whereas the thing that hurt me most is taking away my plot for world domination or getting a few hundred thousand dollars or whatever. Well, that goes back to Hammurabi too, doesn't it? Where the children are treated as an extension of the father rather than as persons in their own right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was common enough among Roman law and Greek law and just about everybody else. So again, Israel was refreshingly unique and dedicated to individual freedom in this respect with regard to normal civil practices. And yet we look at here and the children were executed but and, and we can deal with that in a minute. But uh, and by the way, there's no wife on the scene. He seems not to either to be a widower, or the wife was away, or just doesn't have one for some reason. But the children are executed. But I think we're we're drawn more to how. But how about these other guys who died in battle? 
they have no, their connection is distant. They weren't consenting to the act. They did not know about the act, nor were they particularly the ones responsible to find out about the act. That would have been up to their elders. There's nothing that says that these individuals who died failed in their responsibility to make sure that everything was hunky dory. Uh, they were just sent into battle and the punishment upon all Israel, and it would affect all Israel to some extent, but obviously their own families most of all. The, Israel had collectively disobeyed God because their leaders had not done what they needed to do, which was to check with God before you go into battle. <laughs> now, right at the beginning, and, and the hint to all of this well, it's, it's mentioned in the previous chapter, the hint at the beginning of verse 7. The children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. They took of the accursed thing, we're told. Uh, God says to Israel, Israel said, they're told to Joshua, uh, they've transgressed my covenant, for they have even taken of the accursed thing. And then they used to tell them, um, Israel, sanctify yourselves. There is an accursed thing in the middle of you. So uh, it shall be taken, it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He then all that he hath, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he hath brought folly in Israel. So cursing. Well, when we go back and look at the previous chapter, we see uh, chapter 6, verse 17. Speaking of Jericho, the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. And only the Ray, only Rahab the harlot and her family. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. There's the pot, Acor. <laughs> Uh, but all the silver and gold now, and that sounds like one thing, but then something happens here that we may not be ready for. But all the silver, gold, and vessels of brass and iron uh, are consecrated of the Lord, for they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And so we're told they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man, woman, young, old, ox, sheep, ass, the edge of the sword, and so on. Um, they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But the children of Israel committed a trespassing and accursed thing. So what's going on here? This word accursed has only one meaning to us. It means it's really bad and bad things are going to happen to it. But that's not quite what's going on here. The word is more subtle and broad in its meaning. It has the idea of that which has been devoted wholly to God. God has a claim on it in his wrath. That which survives his wrath then becomes his. And so the silver and the gold and the brass, the metal things that can serve without fire, become his personal property. Nobody gets any of it. Nobody, when they loot the town, spoil the town, nobody gets to take any of the gold, silver treasures, gems, anything like that home to themselves. So and when that, Paul talks about those things that are saved but as through fire. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. exactly. Okay. Uh, some things can survive the fire. Some things are burned up. And, and so when we come to this, we're talking about the accursed thing. We have to understand that Jericho was unique. It was the first fruits of the um, conquest of Canaan, and God did something very special with it. He said, it is mine. Once you get once you get past this and you conquer other cities, you can take stuff. You can get rich off of this. But we're starting, whether you think first fruits or tithe or the Lord's Day, the first part is mine. And to acknowledge that this is part of my ongoing holy war. We've talked about holy war already. Uh, you must keep your hands off of this and anything that survives the fire comes to me and I destroy everything else. Or you, I give you the fire and you destroy everything else. And so that's the context. Israel is here fighting a holy war, which is to say they are acting as priest warriors. And this is what I meant earlier when I said, yeah, you're dealing with directly with God. It's more than just that in a vague sense in that you're not just talking to another human being. You're actually talking to God. But God has put you in his army, put a sword in your hand, given you a battle program, given you specific details, and said specifically, but don't touch that. <laughs> specific instructions to very, the contrary, Achan. Very, yeah, very specific. And so when Achan does that, he violates the whole meaning of the conquest of Jericho. Uh, Israel as a whole 
as a united army, as as men standing before God as his personal administration. Remember, this is this was kind of a new thing. Uh, God was not in the habit of commissioning uh, his people to carry swords and go kill people. He had done it a few times now, starting with uh, with Amalek at the beginning of the forty years, and then the uh, the Amorite tribes on the other side, just a couple a year or so back now from where they're standing right now, and then Jericho. So this is something they're still getting used to, being warriors in God's holy army. And God, it's very tight here, very clear. There's no room for confusion. And so when they've done this, you would think the leaders would stop before they go into the next battle and say to God, who knows everything, did we do all right? Did we miss something? Performance feedback. Yes. Exit entrance, please. Uh, what 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 went on, and and unfortunately they didn't. And as they get ready for the next battle, they also do not ask God. Uh, here's this little city. Uh, you know, it's a town. It's not even a city. Maybe it's not even. It's more like a village. And and the the feedback he gets from his guys, from the spies, is you know we just need a few thousand people. So the town probably only had a couple hundred inhabitants. So a few thousand, we got this no problem. And at no point do they consult with God. And they're dropping out of this from sort of from rank one down to rank two. We're going from personally dedicated, directed strike force for God down to general army still working for God. We haven't cleared things with the top command. And on our own initiative, we're going to say, we don't need to take this very seriously because... Mm -hmm. Anybody could do this. <laughs> There's a problem with that. And, and there are some spiritual lessons there. Sometimes we look at, at particular struggles, sins, problems in our lives, and we say, this is hard. This is really hard. I need help. I need counseling. I need a friend. I need prayer. I need whatever. And we fight our way through it. We come out with a sigh. Think, well, that was hard, but God was faithful. And then some little thing comes up. And, you know, the cat trips us and we kick him across the room. <laughs> or our little girl spills something and we explode because we're not ready for that next little thing. It's a little thing. Is it not a little one? It's just I like, shouldn't need prayer for this. Yeah, I shouldn't need prayer for this. I don't need God's grace. I, I can handle this. Well, no. <laughs> nope. About that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. You can't. Um, and, and not only is this holy war, it's holy war. You're going out onto a battlefield. It's unconscionable for commanders not to make sure that their men are coming back alive. Um, you know, we've, we've had our, our share of generals, both in American history and European history, where their reputation is they won all their battles. Didn't care how many men it cost them, mm -hmm. but boy, they won. One who became a U.S. president comes to mind. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not the Christian approach. And that's to battle, nor is the Christian approach to ministry, which is what this is. These are acts of worship. And if I hadn't said that yet, I didn't make that real clear. This warfare, being holy warfare, is an act of worship. They are priests worshiping God with the sword. What you do in the presence of God is a whole lot different from what you do on a tennis court or a soccer field, or even in protecting your home from an intruder. We, we have not only this and like things you can think of, uh, well, just a Bible study last night. We were talking about uh, Uzzah, who puts forth his hand to steady the ark, and God smites him. He meant well. He wasn't the one who came up with the plan of moving the whole thing by a cart. But And he was put in a horrible predicament. If I let the ark fall, there goes the covenant. If I touch it, I break God's law. I'm sure God will understand. No. But well, that's the funny thing, too, about Uzzah is that especially, well, throughout the Old Covenant, we see these external acts of judgment that God delivers. And we don't know what that says about as a soul. We no. don't know ultimately how God looks on his sin. We know how God dealt externally with this action. With this particular covenant action, because he's a Levite and he's in the presence of God and he ought to know. We're not told, you know, when the ark came back in the Philistines and a bunch of people, it was a priestly city. And a bunch of people got up and opened the ark and, and 
you know, all of that. Eventually, they stepped over a line and God judged them. But the law says you weren't even supposed to look at the ark. It was supposed mm -hmm. to be covered. And, and God cut them a lot of slack. But there comes a point where he says, you know, that's, you're, you're over the top now. That's, you've lost all reverence here. You're just, you're treating like a freak show. Um, and you can think of uh, Nadab and Abihu offer strange fire before the Lord. They got everything right. I mean, right God. They weren't, they weren't worshiping the false God. It was the right place. It was the tabernacle. It was the right incense. They were the right people. They were, it was their job to offer incense. All they did was offer the wrong fire and God smote them dead, burned them up. But you know, you come to the New Testament, and there's Anna, Ananias and Sapphira. Mm -hmm. They brought money that they said represented the whole price of the land. And Peter's very clear. You didn't have to sell your land. You didn't have to give it to the church. You didn't have to give all of it to the church. You could have just given part if you wanted to. But you brought a gift into the presence of God and you lied to make a name for yourself. You lied to the Holy Ghost and you're dead now. And one yeah. by one, they dropped dead. And we can think too of the Lord's Supper. Paul warns the Corinthians that some among them have, have become ill and some have fallen asleep or died because of their, their abuse of the supper. And we're not told specifically what they did. We're not told that they were uh, great sinners, the ones who died. Maybe they were. Maybe they were the ones who were visiting prostitutes and suing each other in court. But maybe they weren't, because what Paul in that chapter talks about is eating the supper before other people get there or getting drunk at the supper. But here again, what, what we're seeing is these are things that happen in the presence of God. The closer you come to the presence of God, the more serious things get, and the more the rep the representation ties you to instantaneous and serious judgment. So as as we continue considering this, that's that I think is key. It's not just that it was a God thing. Uh, it's not just that they were in covenant together, although they were. These are all true things, but specifically, it's this issue of this: these things were a curse. And, and notice we've got a uh, a garment from Shinar, a Babylonianish garment. So that's you know kind of icky. Oh, you mean this comes from the place where we're at, called Babel, where man rebelled against God? That's. <laughs> I was going to ask about that because Babylon wasn't a world empire, so it's talking about the city or the region where. Yeah, Babylon, Babylon, was built. Babylon came came and went a number of times. Um, but they would know of it. And I believe the Hebrew is uh, a garment of shine, Shinar. So mm, it's okay. it's from that region. But the other stuff, the gold and silver, should have gone through the fire and gone into the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. He stole <laughs> from God's treasure chest. It's like sneaking into heaven and trying to rob the golden throne. I mean, really, <laughs> how, how stupid do you have to be? How sinful and naive do you have to be to think that this is in any way a good idea? So we've got that. And then we probably should address the whole thing of, of the family. So if you find out at the end that the sons and uh, daughters are included. Now, were they just part of this because of covenant responsibility? That's possible. I think in this case, it's more likely. Tents were not like huge houses. Tents mm -hmm. were maybe a little larger than Boy Scout tents, but not a whole lot. And to hide things, something under the floor might be a little bit difficult without collusion from your family. Uh, I, I think it's probably, in, in light of what you have already read, the children should not be put to death for the sins of the fathers. I, I, I think we can probably say that it, taking it as far as the death penalty probably means that they were not, that, that they were directly involved, that they at least were accessories after the fact. If not, it just goes to, again, to show you that in this particular circumstance, God's holiness is not something to mess around with. And, um, you know. And it's it, not just between you and God. It's between you and God and the church around you. And the church around you. When Nadab and Abihu died because of the fire, uh, Moses had to tell Aaron, don't you dare weep. Mm -hmm. Let us relieve you follow through and continue ordination, lest God be angry with the whole congregation. There's one other story. I don't remember if in, in our uh, 
projected course of, of uh, study we come to it or not. But at the end of Joshua, when the battles are over and the children of Israel going back to their various tribal locations, um, some of the tribes, three, two and a half of the tribes, uh, Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh, going back across Jordan. And mm -hmm. no sooner have they gone than word comes to Joshua and uh, Phinehas and the, and the others that they built an altar. And immediately, to their credit, Israel says, we got to go to war. You um, can't have another altar to the Lord. No, there's only one altar. And and they actually eventually tell uh, these tribes, tomorrow you rebel, today you rebel, tomorrow God's going to be angry with the whole congregation. See, they've learned their lesson. But again, it's a matter of worship. It isn't that they broke a speeding law. <laughs> it isn't that they stole somebody's property. It isn't even that they killed somebody. Uh, in in God's mind, is those those are bad things. This is in a class all by itself. This has to do with the centrality of the gospel, the salvation of the world, and that's a far more important theme than whether somebody did seventy five in a sixty mile zone, or even whether or not somebody killed his neighbor in a fit of rage. Uh, this is something that goes very deep and very far, and so. But but is, Israel is wise enough that before they jump into battle, they send representatives and they send good representatives. They send the best people they got to try to talk them down off the off the ledge and say, well, "Look, you can't be doing this now. If your land's unclean, we'll give you some of ours. But don't do this. Don't rebel, or God's going to be angry with all of us." And they say, "No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. You completely misunderstand. We, this it's just a monument. We're not doing no sacrifice in here. It's just to remind." your children in the future and ours that we all belong together and that we all have interest in that same altar and tabernacle we're not why we're not putting any sacrifices here it's a memorial uh, in the shape of an altar it's <laughs> yeah, not an altar it is not an altar it just kind of looks like one and so everybody's happy with that but there again to today you sin with regard to the worship of the lord of what you do before the face of god and tomorrow god will be angry with the whole congregation mm -hmm. And, and this is something that, that holds when pastors, elders are unfaithful. They don't defend the church from false doctrine. They offer, as it were, strange fire before the Lord, false doctrine, false worship. God may remove those congregations and, and little innocent grandmas and grandpas who were faithful for many years may get caught up in it. And they may not know what in the world's going on and why people are preaching some kind of strange things and why everybody's yelling and shouting and why our church building is being shut down and no one comes anymore. But God will remove branches, candlesticks that are unfaithful. Mm -hmm. And we could do an entire lesson on the uh, chapters two and three of Revelation at this point, of the danger of losing your candlestick if you do not guard the purity of the church when Jesus comes to see it. Of again, mm -hmm. what you do in the presence of God and what you do in the worship of God. Speaking of Jesus, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this idea of representation is absolutely critical. Because I can hear, or I can imagine hearing Christians hearing this and thinking, no, this this is just reprehensible to me. I, I think God treats us all as individuals. But if we fall back on that, what do we lose? Well, what we lose is a Savior who can represent us covenantally, at which point Jesus becomes nothing more than a great example. He, he showed us how God loves because he died. You know, it's not really clear how that works, but somehow... <laughs> Let some, me demonstrate my love for you by perishing by, horribly. By dying. I, I came to tell you about and God's And for no love. reason. And right. for no reason. I just, I died senselessly because people didn't like the moral message I was giving. But by dying, I showed you that God apparently wanted you to be good people and... And I came to tell you about that and show you, I'm not clear exactly how great, how he was going to show his love, but he did, because <laughs> in the end he's rejected and he's killed. And that's it. And so we look to Jesus as this great example of God's love in what he said and ultimately what he did, dying a martyr. Uh, and, and that's it. That's all and Jesus that's did. And that's not the gospel without no. the covenant union of Christ. <laughs> that is not the gospel. So that brings us 
back again to a movie we've talked about before, American Gospel, the second one, where the um, the people who are being checked out and interviewed by the by the movie makers the keep coming makers, back yeah. with this. Well, God's love. He just he doesn't need to punish his son. I mean, that's that's reprehensible. Um, you don't punish one person for someone else. And you don't sacrifice your child. The world agrees that child sacrifice is a wicked thing. So God couldn't possibly do any of that. Uh, and, and so we're left with God gave us Jesus as some kind of example of love, and we're supposed to live up to it. And that apparently is the gospel. And I, re I remember a couple of the young punk naysayers kind of making a joke out of, well, we don't really know what the gospel is. I mean, at which point in the Bible, because they, they all get it, they all say it differently, they all get it different. I don't, I can't say what the gospel is. You just want to be there. And, and you're willfully blind. <laughs> yeah, after slapping them a couple times, yeah. <laughs> um, which is not the Christian way of doing things, but you feel like doing it anyhow. Um, you want to say. Indwelling sin. Yeah, exactly. You want to say to them, so you do not know what the gospel is. Do you then believe that one can have fellowship with God, go to heaven, live eternally, without believing a gospel that you can't define? So are you are you telling us that the gospel, either A, the gospel is totally irrelevant to anything and you, you'll do just fine without it, or B, are you telling us that you're damned eternally and we shouldn't be listening to you? Which, which of these, because either way, we shouldn't be listening to you. Well, of course, they would say that's dualistic thinking. Yes. We don't believe in either ors. Yes. Well, God does. Uh, I mean, also, just as a rebuttal to that idea, it's like, oh, well, that, you know, the common phrase, you know, cosmic child abuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what uh, David Bentley Hart calls it and a mm. few others. Um, it's It's really not because of the obvious reasons that scripture very clearly describes it not being that way but also jesus went to it willingly yeah. and it wasn't because of stockholm syndrome <laughs> <laughs> um, i mean yeah. honestly um I, I feel like this is where a really robust doctrine like trinitarian doctrine and uh, that's that is informed by the history of the church uh regarding that doctrine really helps hedge against frankly stupid statements like this because <laughs> if you look at you know divine simplicity it's like the actions of the godhead are they belong to all the members of the godhead it's mm -hmm. not that you know god the father is not opposed in action or will or desire to the actions of of god the son in fact they're so united that the term that's been uh described to use to describe this, it's inseparable operations. Mm. There's another term that I meant to use tonight. I didn't see how in the world I was going to get there, but you just opened the door. <laughs> Perichoresis. It's the idea that the Father is in the Son and the Son in the Father. You think of Jesus' um, upper room discourse or farewell discourse. When he's trying to drive home his unity with the Father, and he does not merely say, although it, to merely say this would be incredible, I'm God, and the Father's God. We're one essence. But having established there that they are the same God and one essence, it kicks even further as, as regards to being distinct persons. Nonetheless, there is a mutual indwelling. that whenever we meet the Father, we meet the Son. Whenever we meet the mm -hmm. Son, we meet the Father. Um, they, it, it's not like um, a three-sided crystal where you can look into one side of the crystal and see all of the crystal but you're only confronted with the one face. And then you turn the crystal and you see a different face and you see the whole crystal. That's but the other face, Patrick. Yeah, it, it, it is a form of that to be sure. And and the doctrine of perichoresis helps- Dispel that. Get, <laughs> dispel that, get it at even more. Not only are they all the one God with a common consciousness and will, but the person of each is with and in the person of the other all the time. So they're always doing everything together. And so when you talk about the, the the sacrifice of the son, one, it's the same God. Mm -hmm. Two, 
it's not the son as held at arm's length being told, go do something mean and nasty or let something violent happen to you. It's the persons wrapped up in one another agreeing that this is the loving thing that they want to do that he wants to do. And, and it's not, uh, for instance, Abraham offering up Isaac, although even Abraham did that by faith. Uh, but this is something that takes it to to levels we can't even begin to understand. The deep unity uh, that is the Godhead. But And then we can go back even further. The unity of God's love and justice. Uh, these these uh, progressive Christians. And this comes out in the movie. Keep saying, well, why... Why can't God do why does God need to be just? Why can't he's God? He can just arbitrarily forget about the whole justice thing and just love people. Just forget about their sins. Why should he have to punish anybody? Because he's God and he doesn't have justice. He doesn't have love. He isn't mostly love and a little justice, mostly grace and a little wrath. He is God. He is righteousness and truth and justice and love. And just matters how we see him with our, from our historical perspective, but that but with that which happened on the cross, we see the greatest love and grace of God and the greatest wrath and justice of God all wrapped up in the same thing at the same time. Yep. Um, God can't be other than Himself. But what this whole progressive thing does is it tries to bring and I appreciated the way you said that earlier. It brings God down to what I am comfortable with, mm. what meets my sensibilities. Well, not I to mention would, yeah, what ahead. what meets your logical understanding yeah. of a being. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh well, can't have three persons in one substance. We have to <laughs> it, it, clearly these are three miniatures that are talking amongst each other. Yeah, yeah. We have a club called God that has three members, and one of them is mean and brutal, and the other is loving and kind. Okay, that's modernism, Patrick. Tritheism. Partialism. <laughs> Partialism. It's yeah. definitely tritheism as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a whole lot at there's, once. There's, there's a lot of, of different heresies you can commit at the same time. No, and, and sometimes people wonder, well, why do you get into all this stuff about the Trinity and unity and simplicity? This weird thing you call perichoresis. We're, why does this matter? We're talking Isn't about what God does. relationship <laughs> with Jesus that counts? Yeah. Isn't that the important thing? Yeah. Oh, boy. And, you know, we, uh, we could be blamed for talking things that are too deep or too high or people can check out oh, that's too hot that's too deep for me no it isn't and you need to discipline your mind to hear what god is telling you uh, the hidden things of the lord are, are the lord's but the things which he's revealed belong to us and our children that we may do all the words of the law. if god tells us these things there is application there is need mm -hmm. in us there ought to be a hunger in us to learn these mm. things and to get them right and to keep reminding of ourselves because it's so easy to forget. Mm -hmm. It's 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 like looking at a at a a stream or a river and seeing still water and thinking that's that's not that complex, but then you realize how deep it goes. <laughs> yes, and, and all the all, little eddies uh, and all the little subcurrents and all the things that are alive there that are invisible to the naked eye, but the river wouldn't be the river if all that weren't there. And why is it moving anyway? I don't see anything pulling or pushing it. Why are mm. these sharp rocks here? <laughs> and why are these rocks so dull? Mm, it's like it has a history or something. <laughs> anyway, anyway, there we go. That is, I think, our discussion, at least of the high point of this little thing. And what, as I said, how it ends is the children of Israel get serious and they go back to God. God gives them a plan. Uh, and it's... Um, it's a plan that we've, oh, that we see again later on in the book of, of uh, Judges. But this is, there's the first time. You're going to put some people behind the city. They're going <laughs> to hide. And then you're going to send a strike force up. And they're going to run away until all the men are on the city. Then your lurkers are going to come and take the city and send fire to heaven. And, and, and they'll all come out. And there are things in the Christian life that deserve all of our energy and interest and focus, uh, especially when the whole life of the church is concerned. Mm. You know, th there are some things that we can get along without fussing with each other about. But in every generation, there are some things where we can't. Mm. And those are the things that concern the gospel. In every generation, the gospel is attacked a little differently. 
And it's easy to say, oh, that's, that's, you know, this is a big thing. That thing over there, yeah, that's just dumb. We're not going to worry about that. Someone can handle that. And we, we need to be careful. We need to be serious. We need to not be those who surrender a congregation, uh, a classes or presbytery uh, denomination to some little heresy that's going to turn around and eat us all up in the next generation. Mm-hmm. We, those of us who are called to office, those of us who have been given the gift of understanding theology need to be very responsible here. I think as people listen to us, I hope they see that the thing we come back to again and again is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things we love to talk about, a lot of fun things, but that's, I think, has been the line we've drawn in the sand. Uh, all right, hope in concrete. This is, this, this is salvation. This is your God. This is the way he's ordained. There are no other options. And however little this deviation may seem, if it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ, then let it be anathema. Mm-hmm. All right. That's a good place to stop for the evening and make some recommendations. Yes. I mean, I I would love to, to uh, recommend things. In fact, I would like to re- Commend to you all um, <laughs> something I've already recommended once. So is that a re-recommend? I don't know. In any case, um, since I talked about it a little bit towards the end there, uh, I figured it is a as good a time as any to recommend once again uh, James Dolezal's excellent book, All That Is In God. Mm-hmm. If you want a quick, I can't say easy, but it is at least very... Uh, succinct <laughs> uh, primer on divine simplicity and the doctrine of cla- uh, classical Christian theism as it has been expressed in the church for the past roughly 2,000 years. I highly recommend it. He is a, uh, a very, very intelligent Reformed Baptist. Um, I believe he's a minister now, and it is excellent. I'm actually overdue for a reread to refresh myself on the concepts because it, it – some of these deeper topics, they have a habit of like getting into your head and you go like, wow, that's great. And then you forget about it three months later because it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, James Dole's all, all That Is In God, um, the full version of that phrase is all that is in God is God. Hmm. Recommended. Great. Greg, do you want to go next? Uh, I'm going to recommend... Uh, Cornelius Van Til's uh, Introduction to Systematic Theology. It's best probably for people who already understand systematics. And here we're talking Introduction to Systematic is actually about the doctrine of God um, more than anything else. It doesn't deal with everything that falls under systematics by any means. But it talks particularly about the doctrine of God. It's it, it's what he has picked up largely from, from Herman Bobbing. And Van Til is not the um, greatest or smoothest or clearest of authors. <laughs> so that's why I say, if you don't know anything about this topic, probably you can start with Brian's recommendation and work up for this. But if you if, if you have a pretty good grip on on simplicity and the unity of God and the Dark of Trinity, this will begin to pull some things together for you philosophically. And begin to point in interesting directions. It'll challenge your thinking. It'll challenge your ability to understand English. Um, <laughs> but it's 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 at the same time simple and profound. It's like it's it's simple in that he doesn't really use big words too much. He does occasionally, but sometimes you're not sure what in the world he just meant. But if you think it through, there's meat to chew on that goes beyond just what theologians tend to think about. It begins to break out into the realms of philosophy and history and sociology and things like that. It begins. Other people have taken it from there. But if you haven't read this, then you might not know what they're talking about. So Cornelius Van Til, uh, Introduction to Systematics or Systematic Theology. All right. I'm going to take a left turn, left turn or possibly a wormhole from there. Um, to Bob Dylan's gospel album, Slow Train Coming. Mm. Just because I enjoy Cornelius Van Til's writing for many of the same reasons that I enjoy this <laughs> album by Bob Dylan. 
I want to at some point put together a quiz of who said it, Bob Dylan <laughs> or Cornelius Van Til, because I think that would just be a blast. Um, but I, I get that Bob Dylan's not everybody's cup of tea, um, vocal style wise, but the songs are really excellent. And if you want to just expand your musical horizons a little bit, I highly recommend this album. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. This has been a great time. Yes, thank you all. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our financial supporters for helping to keep the show rolling. We really appreciate you. Thank you, our listeners, just for tuning in. Um, we love hearing from you anytime you send us an email. So if you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, please do so. Our email address is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Um, other places you can find us are any podcast catcher. If you have a podcast catcher and we're not on it, please let us know because we can fix that. We can at least try. <laughs> um, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. You can check out our show notes and transcripts there. And you can like our Facebook page. It hasn't been terribly active lately because I left Facebook and that means that David is responsible for <laughs> posting memes, which means it doesn't happen. <laughs> um, at least lately. We've had a lot going on. So lamentably few memes lately, but uh, there may be more eventually. We'll see. I think that's all of the extra information that I can cram into my brain at this late hour. So... <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. We hope to see you next week.